All right, welcome to single cell genomics. We already talked about single molecule genomics. Um, so this is sort of the second in this issue of single, of single level um, analysis of various types. Right, so just as a reminder, cells are extremely diverse in multicellular organisms, <clears throat> even in unicellular organisms, the amount of number of cell behaviors can be astonishing. So cells can be very different from each other and just sort of a simple, you know, example to demonstrate this, comparing, say, fibroblasts with endothelial cells. Endothelial cells are tight, you know, coming up all tight, nice and tight with each other, making these junctions. The fibroblasts are crawling around looking for defects in their matrix that they can repair. You know, three different types of blood cells here. You know, some have nuclei, some don't have nuclei. Um, this neuron, of course, is, you know, and this is where I think single cell genomics and, tr and transcriptomics has really, you know, yielded the most returns, looking even at subcellular genomics. Um, right, so you have these, you know, all these different, you know, processes that, you know, really behaving actually quite differently compared to other parts of the cell, even. Right, and the cells are, are existing in complex environments, right, and so, and, you know, a neuron may have specific neighbors, specific synaptic par partners, a muscle cell is going to be, you know, normally in a bundle with, you know, connected tissue around it. And all of these, you know, aspects of cellular phenotype are really controlled by, you know, which genes a cell is deciding to express and how all that is controlled. You know, in many cases, you really can only study that in vivo at the level of single cells. All right, so we talked about model organs in genomics, you know, a few lectures ago. Um, worms, my favorite organism, have 302 neurons. And so in the case of worms, you can make a GFP fusion protein. You can go in and find out, is this expressed in neurons? If so, which neurons? You can make a list of all the neurons that express that GFP fusion. That's great, right? Flies, many more, much more complicated um, nervous system than worms. Unfortunately, for the worms, they're sort of stupid little critters. Although pretty smart, given the, the intelligence per neuron is pretty high. Um, you know, the 10, about uh, 10,000 neurons here in this, um, this is a fly um, um, larvae, I believe. And um, you know, again, fairly complicated nervous system. You know, nothing compared to our nervous system. Here's here's my um, my eminent co um, co instructor, John Hoganish, and um, you know his brain has something like the twelfth neurons, to the thirteenth glial cells, ten to the fifteenth synapses. And there's interactions between the glia and synapse and the glia and the neurons as well. And so there's this incredible web of interactions, you know, of, between these distinct neurons and different distinct, they can be distinct because of different locations in the brain or because of distinct molecular identities, you know, giving rise to the complex behavior that allows John to give a lecture for this course, well as my worms could never give a lecture for this course. All right, so there's, <clears throat> we'll talk about different ways to, to analyze single cells. Well, we talked in a single molecule lecture about some of these as well, right? So you can you can dilute cells down by um, 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 or, or analyze single cells by facts and do things to them. You can pull cells out of tissue. I mean, this is um, in this case by um, laser capture microdissection. Here's where the cell used to be, and here or, and you can so we can pull, pull out specifically these particular cells that we're interested in. And we talked in a you know, single molecule um, approach about actually doing stuff in vivo. In this case, this is C. elegans embryos, where a particular single mRNA has been labeled in each of the, um, so each dot there is a single mRNA. So, so all of these approaches have different pros and cons, but, but you know, in the case of actual genomic studies, you really need to actually take the cell and do something to it to look at all of the genes. So. So here's the um, sort of overview of the kinds of methods that a single cell resolution gives you. There's the sort of in situ type approaches, right? So we talked about in the in the, again in the single molecule lecture, and to a certain extent in the um, in the model organism genomics lecture as well about either fixed specimen labeling where you go in with an in situ hybridization probe for a particular mRNA or imaging of reporters where you can either do fixed specimen or live imaging over time, and those allow you to look. You know, and potentially across many cells, all cells in some some organisms, such as worms, but only for really one gene, a small number of genes at a time, right? So a true single cell genomics method, single cell genomics method, lets you look in single cells at the whole genome, right? And so that's you know fundamentally different from what's done with these in situ kind of studies, and sort of is the focus of this lecture, and you know the key. Uh, technical challenge is how to amplify the relative relevant biomolecules to, 
to a, up to a level where you can actually detect them. Right. And there the key thing is that you're getting actually genome-wide information from single cells, not just individual um, genes. Right. Right, so the in vivo um, studies are labor, um, are labor intensive, and so it, these actually have been applied at genome scale, right? So this is um, you know, from the, the study that we referenced before, looking where they tagged every single gene in yeast with a GFP fusion. This is from, from Aaron O'Shea and Jonathan Weissman's lab in the early 2000s. You know, and you can look at images from, from such a collection, and if you take a picture of all 6,000 different strains of yeast, you can see some, you know, for example, localize your, your particular protein that, you're, that you tag to the nucleus or to the membrane or maybe to the spindle. You know, but that's very labor intensive. I mean, you have you know, separate you know, plate to keep track of each of these 6,000 different um, um, yeast strains. That's thousands of plates. You have to take 6,000 different pictures, at least, to take you know, pictures of every different one of these strains. So that's a lot of work. And then if you decide, oh, well, I want to look at the, what happens to all these proteins when you, um, you grow the yeast on galactose instead of glucose, well, you have to take 6,000 more pictures, right? So it also you know, it doesn't scale very well. Right. And the same thing you know, for you know, the case of worms or flies. Again, you know, we talked about the large-scale in situ hybridization projects in flies. There have been GFP fusion constructs made for you know, nearly all the genes in worms, although only a few hundred of those have actually been made into worm strains where you can actually look at the at where the protein actually goes within the worm. So there's a lot of work to make to make these. And doing you know a lot of studies at genome scale is really hard, probably not feasible in most cases. Right. So for single cell genomics, I mentioned that the key challenge is amplification. Right. And so we can think about amplification in the concept of sort of the central dogma as to, you know, the three main categories of molecules that we'd like to be able to measure at the level of single cells. And so for DNA, right, so each cell has, you know, in most cases, one or two copies of the genome, right? And some genes are expressed in that cell, other genes are not expressed in that cell. But, you know, typically you can have, you know, up to a thousand messenger RNA molecules from the genome for for the only the one genomic copy. And then for the proteome, you know, you can have on the order, you know, from hundreds of molecules per cell up to maybe 10 to the seventh molecules per cell um, during, um, <clears throat> um, you know, again, made from that, you know, comparatively small number of messenger RNA molecules. And so these, these are biological amplification steps that are used to take the one copy or two copies of the genome and translate to 10 to the seventh protein copies. That's a very high full, full magnitude of induction. Right, so those are um, so we can take advantage of the same approaches that are used um, by by cells to do this to experimentally amplify biomolecules. And one other um, thing that we'll come to is is the, the genome. You know, even though there's only one or two copies per cell, you can have a cell divide to make millions of cells. You know, over several rounds of cell division, and it does that by copying its own genome. You know, again with polymerases. And so if you want to amplify the genome, you can basically take DNA polymerases, and there's particular ones that work better than others, or you can do PCR, again, using um, you know, so you can either do targeted amplification of particular regions in the genome, or you can try and do whole genome amplification with a, with a non-specific polymerase and try and increase the number of copies of the genome in your sample. In the case of the transcriptome, so if you, again, you have one to a thousand copies of your mRNAs, you can turn, convert those back into cDNAs, you could use the same kind of methods, PCR polymerase, you know, DNA polymerase-based based methods. And we'll talk about uh, T7 amplification, which is, which uses an RNA polymerase-based method, which has some um, certain advantages in terms of the, um, the, the linear nature of the amplification. And proteome is sort of the, the, the um, unfortunate um, bystander here. It's just, Single cell proteomics, even th it's uh, sort of ironic, even though there's so many more copies per cell of individual proteins, you know, there really is no way to take one protein and turn it into more proteins. And so you sort of have to go back and infer stuff from the transcriptome level one way or, or the other in the vast majority of cases. All right, so just to summarize, we'll talk about, about genomic DNA amplification from single cells using using primarily this 5C31 polymerase method. We'll talk about transcriptome amplification. And the protein, basically, you're, you're, you have to go back to the single protein kind of levels and, 
and, and hope for the best. All right, so if you want to amplify the genome of your one cell, so still I think the state-of-the-art method is to use, use some, one of the many kits that are now available based on this Phi29 um, phage um, polymerase. And the key attributes of this polymerase, one, it's um, mesophilic, right? So you can do a reaction at you know, a reasonable temperature. It's extremely processive. So I put 10 kilobases here as a processive. That's really a lower bound. You can get very, very long molecules uh, made off of, you know, from this 529 polymerase. And, it's, and it does strand displacement. And so what strand displacement means, if you have, now here's some random primers here, you start amplifying each one of these around this, this in this case, Imagine this is a bacterial genome, or maybe you've circularized DNA from a mammalian genome. And what happens when the polymerase gets to this primer that's stuck there is it displaces it. And so it keeps going around, and so it'll just keep going through here and displacing the strand that, that was in front of it. Again, you know, this high, combined with this high processivity, you can, you can get this, these really long, long um, amplified molecules. And as you create these new strands that you've displaced off of your original strand, those can then prime, if you have a random primer in there, with additional, you know, additional polymerase molecules going on to start amplifying those. And so you get this, this, this um, um, <clears throat> strand displacement rolling circle amplification. Um, you can actually get, you know, just by mixing this polymerase and some random primers with your DNA, a thousand-fold amplification of your starting DNA material. And the bias is fairly low, which is the other key advantage. So, so it wouldn't be that helpful if it, for example, didn't amplify AT-rich sequences or GC-rich sequences, but it turns out it's fairly permissive, and so you can get pretty much the representative copy number of the, DNA, of the genome that you had in to begin with. So what is this good for? I mean, really, one of the most powerful applications has been... Um, to look at uncultable microbes. So you know, we, we know a lot about the genome and genetics of you know, bacteria like E. coli, sal um, salmonella, the, um, <clears throat> B. subtilis, so forth and so on, you know, sort of the traditional culturable microbes. I actually worked as an undergraduate with Mary Lidstrom in a lab that studied methane oxidizing bacteria, which it turns out you can culture these, but you actually have to, you know, basically take your environmental samples to isolate these things, streak them on plates, and then put them in a in a cylinder that you would evacuate the atmosphere and replace it with methane, because so these are microbes that only grow in a methane atmosphere. And you know, and there's there's, you know, a ridiculous, you know, the vast majority of the microbial diversity on Earth hasn't been or can't be cultured. And so what you know. There's sort of two approaches for those, and, and one of them is to just, just not try and culture them, just isolate them in situ from their population and just do metagenomic sequencing and try and put it all back together later. But if you really want to know, you know, this particular bac bacteria, what is its genome, you can actually now can take individual cells out and sequence their genome by using this rolling circle, circle amplification method. Now, you can use this you know, in theory, to look at direct um, at a mutation rate, basically looking at, at particular regions, say, in, in cells that share a common ancestor a certain number of generations back. Then used to look at, at recombination somatically. Yeah, so um, really, really the sky's the limit here. So one of, the, actually, the most useful applications is just, you know, I mean, we, we have a collaborator in, who's using this for their model organism work where they... Um, they just, you know, they got a sample where they'd like to have more DNA than they, they can get. So they can, you know, get away with picking a small number of worms and then use this approach to, to basically amplify their DNA up to a level where they can, they can do, um, do the sequencing project that they're trying to do. Okay, so now switching to transcriptomes. Okay, so we talked, you know, about um, single cell level quantitative PCR as a way to look at the expression of one gene in a single cell. You can multiplex this and look at you know, a handful of genes. Right? So you lyse a gene, you add reverse transcriptase. That will convert your messenger RNA into a DNA. And then you can amplify it using primers that are specific for your gene. And you can figure out how many cycles it takes before you see it. And that tells you something about how many copies were in your cell. Now, I want to throw out there that, that 
most of the next gen sequencing protocols actually use a PCR step. So you know, even if you're starting with a lot of material, you know, for example, in, in, in the, and these are moving targets, you know, you're talking about sort of 10 to 18 cycles of PCR between when you actually make your first library and what you actually put on the machine. So you actually, there are rounds of uh, PCR included in most RNA sequencing and DNA sequencing library prep. So PCR, more generally, I mean, you can, you can take any population of molecules, for example, cDNAs, if you want to do this for, for the transcriptome, and you can, you can amplify by PCR ligate on adapters, PCR it up, but there will be some bias because you're not, not every molecule is going to get your, the right adapters. Um, and it has this exponential kinetics, and so, you know, depending on where you are, different molecules may be amplifying at different rates, and so it's, it's hard to directly compare with each other. No, but it's very cheap, right? So, and it's fast, you know, PCR reagents are, are extremely robust. So, and you see this method still used in, you know, the bulk of the studies that have done single cell, you know, RNA sequencing is have you actually used PCR-based amplification methods. All well, this is changing. All right, so if you want to study, and one of the main reasons to look at single cells at the level of their transcriptome is to figure out, you know, where they are and sort of what, what's their gene expression profile. You can think about different cells, maybe even to closely related cells, you know, as being somehow related to each other through some epigenetic landscape, first made popular by Waddington, where, you know, the fertilized egg would be somewhere up here. And this is Mount Waddington, it turns out, is a sort of surrogate for the classical Waddington diagram here. And through development, you know, you go down different paths, maybe you fall down this avalanche chute and you end up in this debris field down here, which corresponds to cardiomyocytes, and maybe another cell goes down this way and turns into a fibroblast. <clears throat> and so to really make any sense of this and the different, you know, basically the relative importance of the difference between, say, a cardiomyocyte and a fibroblast population, you need to not only look at the difference between those populations of cells, but also the differences within those populations of cells and see how different they are. So you need to be able to look at a lot of cells and be able to have accurate quantification. So single, single cell genomics has been a powerful way to do this. And so I think still the, the gold standard, the most quantitative way to amplify a transcriptome is through something called linear cDNA amplification, first developed by Jim Eberwein here at Penn, now, now um, over 20 years ago. And this is basically the schematic for how this works. So you have your messenger RNA. It has a poly-A tail on it, and that's an important feature, you, although you can do this if, for non-polyadenylated messages as well by using, instead of using an oligo-DT primer, you would use just a random primer. So you have your primer, the oligo-DT primer will anneal to the poly-A tail, and it also has the back end of the primer, this um, additional sequence, which includes a T7 promoter. Right? So you, you add reverse transcriptase, you, and you do the second strand synthesis, you end up with a double strand of cDNA. Now this is a DNA molecule that corresponds to your mRNA sequence, and, but it, in addition it has this, this promoter for T7 RNA polymerase stuck to the end of it. And now you add the T7 RNA polymerase, and basically what that will do is begin transcribing new RNAs this way off of this template, and you get a whole bunch of what are called amplified antisense RNAs. Right? So these are now, you know, to a first approximation, identical to the, um, the messenger RNA you started with, but they're on the other strand. And you know, there will be some bias. So if you have a very long mRNA and you started with this oligo DT primer, you know you might only get the area, you know, the three prime region of of your messenger RNA. But you can get pretty long transcripts. So you know, up to a couple of kilobases, you can amplify pretty reliably. And this can give you, with what you know, one round of this amplification, you know, it's between a few hundred and a thousand fold increase in the number amount of material you have relative to the starting material. Right, so if you want to do this from single cells, you know, there's not very much RNA in single cells. You actually might need to do this more than once. And so this is actually demonstrated again by, by Jim Eberwein's group. Um, you, know, you, can, you start this, this top part here is the same as what I just showed you. You put on the all the TT7 primer. You make cDNA. You, um, you transcribe. A new, uh, you know, a new amplification step with a T7 RNA polymerase. You have your, your amplified RNA, and you do the same thing 
you reamplify now with random hexamers. So you can get basically another 400 to 1,000 fold amplification. And you can actually do this for you know, not just two rounds, three, three or more rounds in theory. And in the, the original applica application, this was not actually for, um, for genomics at all, but something called a reverse northern blot, which is sort of cool, basically the idea, a normal, a nor a normal northern blot. You run you know, some complicated RNA mixture on a gel, and then you probe it with a particular probe that targets only one sequence. And that shows you where on that gel and how much of that sequence was present in your gel. A reverse northern blot is, is, is just what it says. Now, instead of running your complicated mixture on a gel, you're running just one sequence you know, on the gel, and then use this, this in this case, the, single, the, the mRNA amplified two, for two rounds, a million-fold amplification from single cells, and you label that, and that's your probe. And then you put that on, on your gel, and you can see now quantitatively how much of each of these um, you know, m messages that we test by the reverse northern is present in my, in my, um, in my single cell. <clears throat> okay, so how quantitative is this? So this is you know, one study that's, that, that looked at this in some detail. So, and this is by, by looking at the accuracy of microarray hybridization. So if you compare just two microarray um, transcriptome quantification experiments um, in terms of for, you know, each dot here is one gene, and this is just how, um, how strongly does that gene appear to be expressed in experiment one versus experiment two, sort of technical replicates. You get a correlation of 0.992, pretty high. <clears throat> now, if you do the same experiment where instead of taking the initial DNA, or the, the initial trans RNA and just labeling it and hybridizing, you first do a round of this Eberwein amplification and then label and put on the microarray, you get basically the same correlation, right? So you get 0.994 in this case, that's not significantly different from 0.992. So you get, so as long as you're comparing gene and amplified sample one with gene and amplified sample two, you're going to get the same result, right? And this, you know, two nanogram is just, you know, again, starting with even less starting material, you get basically the same result. Now it's important though, if you compare the unamplified sample with an amplified sample, so here, you know, this is the unamplified sample here, compared with amplified, you start seeing a drop off. So with one round of amplification, a fairly small amount of amplification, you get a little bit of bias. And as you get to more, so this is a really high amplification, there's actually now a lot of material here which is not amplifying efficiently. Right? And so that non-efficient amplification is fairly reproducible, so as long as your comparison point is also amplified material, it, you, can, you can basically nor correct for that or control for that. But it's important to think about that if you're working with amplified um, transcriptome, not to compare the absolute quantification directly between an amplified and unamplified sample. Right, so here's a summary of the single cell amplification. You know, with one round of this Eberwein amplification procedure, you can get up to a thousand fold increase in your yield of, of RNA and up to a million fold after two rounds. Right, so if you think about a typical mammalian cell has you know, somewhere less than a picogram of messenger RNA, a few hundred thousand molecules, you know, corresponding to a, you know, five to 10,000 different genes. In theory, with one round of amplification, you can get, you know, somewhere near a nanogram, and maybe a microgram of RNA after a couple rounds of amplification. You know, in practice, you don't always get a million full, but still, you know, two rounds of amplification, you can get, you know, many, many nanograms of, um, of RNA, which is, you know, more than enough to use for microarray analysis, or now RNA sequencing has become popular as well for single cells. For, for um, to say, for, for RNA-seq analysis, the, the amount of input for that's required to make the libraries has historically been probably artificially high. And so most of the um, single cell RNA-seq experiments that have been published have used PCR. But um, by microarray, even, even you know, in 2003, people were able to study individual neurons. And so in this case, you, know, you have this, this, <clears throat> this um, chunk of, of nervous system tissue, and you can actually use this laser capture microdissection approach to pick up the cell bodies of these different neurons. Mm -hmm. So this is just looking sort of one at a time. We picked this one, now we picked this one, now we picked um, this one. So they just individually select off one neuron at a time from this population of neurons, and they did a microarray-based expression profile. You know, and the bottom line is that 
each of these neurons does have, you know, they do have significant differences um, between, between them in terms of which genes they're expressing, which is not surprising you know, um, given what we know about the diversity of the nervous system. Now, you, you can do controls like taking, say, two neurons and then splitting them in half, splitting the RNA in half and doing in, independently amplifying them to, see, to compare the variance you get from that compared to the actual variation from, from multiple cells, and that's an important control to do. Um, so this has actually been done even you know, from, from Jim Eberwein and others to look at not just single-cell level genomics, but subcellular genomics. And so you can look, for example, at dendrites. So here's, a, again, some neur neurons growing in culture that go in and actually pick up this particular dendrite. And again, by using genomic methods, you can actually identify, you know, there's a particular subset of transcripts that are present in these dendrites and localized to the dendrites. And they've actually gone on, gone to show that some of these transcripts are being specifically shuttled to these, these you know, potentially postsynaptic regions in the dendrite, being translated there, perhaps in, in response to excitatory cues, possibly even spliced in some cases out at the dendrite. Right, so... Um, so there's all, all sorts of cool biology that's come out of this, you know, in terms of the, the sequences. You know, in some cases, they've actually used repetitive elements, and those have been co-opted as a trafficking signal to cause some of these, these transcripts to be um, moved out to the dendrites. Um, so you can actually, <clears throat> this is just a sort of biochemical assay to show that there actually is um, um, splicing happening out the dendrites. Right. So now, uh, if you think about this in comparison with some of the single molecule approaches that we looked at um, in the single molecule lecture, now you're definitely getting less of the absolute quantification of single cells if you do this multi-round amplification and, and, and genomic approaches than you do by, say, say single molecule fish. And that's, you know, in part due to the biases of, of the amplification procedure itself. So you won't be able to say exactly how many transcripts there are in that cell. But in terms of comparing across cells, you can have, you know, the potential to look at many, many genes, right? Um, I mentioned a little bit the three prime bias. And so if you're, in particular, if you're looking at poly, uh, algo DT primer for your amplification, you're going to tend to get more in um, amplification of the sequences that are near that primer. And so, especially for long genes, the five prime ends of genes won't be amplified as efficiently, right? And, um, and you know, you do lose some complexity as well. So if you're, you have to think about this, if you're amplifying from single cells, you know, you may get a lot of reads for a particular gene, but many of those may actually co have corresponded to a single molecule in the initial sample. And so this loss of complexity is especially important when you're thinking about, you know, even rarer events like splicing. Now, this has... I, mean, I, I, should, I should say that, you know, in, in the last year, there actually have been a couple of approaches using the, the T7 amplification approach to do RNA sequencing. In, one, in some cases, the approach is to basically take your individual cells, ligate on barcoded adapters initially, and then do the amplification after that. And so then, you basically, by reading the barcode, you can figure out which, which reads came from which cell. And that lets you sort of get around this issue of the, the amount of starting material that's needed for the RNA-seq library prep. You know, but, but you can also just do three rounds of amplification, and that, and that works as well. But the, the initial methods to actually do RNA-seq from, from um, single cells use PCR-based amplification methods. And there, the method is sort of just what you might expect. You, you go and you make your cDNA. You, um, you then use you know, sort, of a, sort of a standard PCR-based approach using um, um, basically, if you think your, your original um, cDNA number has the, the A-rich you know, AT sequences at the, the three prime end of the original message, and if you poly A tail the three prime end of your cDNA, then you can basically use a you know, common set of primers to then amplify um, that that region that you made the cDNA out of specifically, and then use that for RNA seq, and that's been done you know now for several different applications. You get more biases if you do um, PCR based ap ap amplification than you do from the T7 amplification in terms of the sequence bias biases. PCR is just not as sequence neutral as 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 T7 amplification is, but um, this has been a pow pow powerful approach as well. So I'm going to talk just briefly about one, um, one applica application um, of single molecule genomics that sort of turns this on its head and sort of has some parallels to, this, to the reverse northerns that we talked about. Right, and, that, and that's the use of transcriptome, tran um, trans or, yeah, transcriptome transfer to, for um, sulfate transition. Now, 
when you think about cell fate transformations, you know, a lot of people think about things like the induced pluripotent stem cells, where, and this has been, been um, you know, initially by Yamanaka and by many others, and for other, other cell types as well, you would take particular master regulators, so in the case of, of, of IPS cells, there's these four um, 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 regulators of ES cell identity, or three plus CMYK, that if you introduce those, those four factors, into, say, a fibroblast, then it reprograms its identity, and it, that fibroblast adopts both the transcriptome and also the cellular behavior that's characteristic of an embryonic stem cell, even to the point of being able to contribute to, um, to a mouse if you inject it into a blastocyst. But that relies on that, and that, now you're actually making a genetic alteration. You're putting in, you know, a totally new set of, of genes and sort of biasing, you know, genetically that cell into to that particular fate trajectory. So the question is, what if you actually just tweak its transcriptome, right? So, and the way this is done by, by Jun Young Kim and Jim Eberwein's lab here at Penn is to transfer RNA, basically the transcriptome of one cell type into a cell that's of another cell type. And they can do this using a method called phototransfection. So basically the idea is you have your cell, in this case a neuron, you bathe it in RNA that you pre prepare, you know, maybe from astrocytes, for example, and then you, you poke holes in the membrane of your cell using, using lasers. And there's particular um, methods that allow you to do this, and that allows the cell to then take up some of that, that RNA. So that's called phototransfection. And so you can do this, for example, with a neuron, and you can culture them in media that, that is what you would normally use to grow an astrocyte. And so if you introduce astrocyte RNA into the neuron, you'll actually see this similar type of conversion of, of, of cellular phenotype. So your neuron starts looking like an astrocyte. Um, and this, um, this plot here, so that's, this is you know, your phototransfection. You know, you, cult, you passage these guys, you photo, you photo transect, you know, a couple more times to get more of this RNA in, and after a few weeks of growing these cells in culture, now they're starting to express markers that are characteristic of astrocytes instead of neurons. And you can actually take those cells, and I told you about the single, single cell genomics method, so you can actually do whole genome um, transcriptome analysis of these cells. And so if you identify, you know, in this case, some, um, this is a, um, the, some genes that are sort of typical, this by micro, in this case by single cell microarray analysis. So you've identified genes that are characteristic of astrocytes or characteristic of neurons. And if you look at the these so-called astrotipper, so these are these are neurons that have been <clears throat> induced by transcriptome transfer to become more like astrocytes. And I should say this is done at a late enough time point that the messenger, the, the mRNAs that are present in those cells when they actually do this experiment are now, they're not the, 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 the astrocyte mRNAs that were originally transferred, but they've actually stably converted the cell fate, right? So it suggests that, at least in the case of this neuro, neuron to astrocyte transformation, the cells are epigenetically plastic. You don't actually need to make a genetic transformation to transfer their, uh, transform their fate. You can actually get a reasonable transformation of fate by just transferring um, the transcriptome. And this is sort of visualizing now in three dimensions the, where the normal astrocytes and these transformed astrocytes fit in sort of a three-dimensional space. Um, this is collapsing you know, the whole genome um, information down to three dimensions. And so the, 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 in this case, these, these transformed astrocytes aren't perfectly like normal astrocytes, but they're in a definitely, definitely in a different place. So you can think about this as sort of different locations in Waddington's landscape compared to the neurons that they started off as. And the, and the, and the same approach has been used to convert um, the fibroblast into, into cardiac cells as well. All right, so just to summarize the single cell genomics lecture, there's really powerful experimental tools to analyze both DNA and RNA populations from single cells. And so we talked about 529 polymerase as a way to amplify the genomes of the individual cells, and T7 linear amplification or Eberwein amplification as the, probably the most powerful way to amplify the transcriptomes of individual cells. Now, proteomics tools, there are proteomics, single cell proteomics approaches, but they're really limited to very small, either the most abundant proteins in the, you know, sort of at the tails of the distribution in particular cells, 
or by you know sort of tagging approaches where you actually go in and actually label particular proteins in particular ways. Right, and so and one, uh, these these approaches are really powerful in working out the dis, um, differences in cell fate and how those arise in the nervous system and other complex tissues.